Morning. My name's Stephen. I'm the CEO of Conversion.com. We're a conversion optimization agency. We focus purely on conversion optimization. And we do this for clients ranging from Facebook, for example, where we support them on things like their, uh, their mobile app, both for Facebook and for Messenger. We also work with companies like The Guardian, where we work both across web and app. Um, we're talking today about mobile conversion optimization in particular. The very first test that we did for The Guardian on their app in particular, so looking at people who install their app and then go on to register with The Guardian. Our very first test that we did with them increased the conversion rate to registration by over 80%, percent eight zero. So what we're going to be looking at today is how we can apply that same strategy to other businesses as well. In particular, we're going to be talking about how mobile conversion optimization can give you a competitive advantage. It's pretty obvious that mobile is becoming increasingly important. It's trite to say that. Um, what I think isn't always spoken about is just how big that opportunity is and how it can give you a competitive advantage. So in the last 12 months, excuse me, in the last 12 months, mobile's share of traffic for UK e-commerce website has, has gone up 3x. So towards the end of 2014, mobile accounted for around 12% of visits to e-commerce sites in the UK. Just one year later, 12 months later, that was 36%, 3x increase. So mobile is increasing exponentially. But at the same time, I'm sure any of you have looked at your website's analytics will know that conversion rates for mobile are often typically much less than desktop. So according to Monetate's e-commerce quarterly, by the end of 2015, a mobile conversion rate was around half that of a desktop conversion rate. Obviously, this represents a huge opportunity. It can give you a massive competitive advantage if you can get it right. The reason why I say it's a competitive advantage is when we look at conversion optimization and how it can apply to your business, we can see the wider impact that it can have. So first off, if you increase your conversion rate, the immediate impact that you will see from that is that your revenue will go up. So if you increase your conversion rate, say 5%, 10% site-wide, you'd expect your revenue to increase proportionally as well. But it goes deeper than that. So the next level is that your profit will increase disproportionately. Because you don't have to spend any more to acquire those visitors to your website, your cost of acquisition stays the same. So that means your profit is disproportionately higher. That in turn means you can buy more traffic. And then this cycle repeats. The more traffic you have, the more you can increase your conversion rate, the more you can test. And so the cycle repeats, eventually meaning that you increase your market share. In total, that gives you an unfair advantage. If your conversion rate is significantly higher than your competitors, it means that your cost per acquisition is lower, and that means that you can acquire more traffic and you can start to increase your market share. So let's kick off by looking at how we can apply this, in particular focusing on mobile. Because mobile is a very different beast to desktop. I'm guilty of this as, as well, but most people, when they start to look at conversion optimization, will immediately go to their desktop. They'll immediately go to their laptop to look at what the desktop experience looks like, rather than going to mobile. And as we can see, traffic increasing on mobile, that's frequently where we should be starting. And mobile is very different to desktop, obviously. The screen is a lot smaller. People are typically using it when they're much more distracted than when they're using a desktop. They use their thumb instead of a mouse. That means that they're, excuse me? That means that there are parts of the screen that, you, that are harder to touch. This doesn't really exist too much on the desktop. It also means that because you're using a thumb, you can't hover over things. You can't see when someone's mouse is about to leave the screen, when they're about to leave their website. This is very sensitive, sorry. Um, on the plus side, though, mobile means that you can do geolocation much more accurately, so there's an advantage there. And also, it's a phone, so it makes it, makes it a lot easier for people to get in touch with you. So if you run a lead generation business, mobile can be one of the biggest opportunities that you have. Let's put that all together. How do you build a mobile conversion optimization strategy? This is a typical framework that we all use in conversion optimization. It will apply whether we're working on desktop or mobile or offline or email, whichever channel we're focusing on. The foundation is that we need to understand what the goals are. We're going to come on to each of these steps in a second. We have to understand what the goals are first. There's no point doing anything else until we have that. A lot of people will be tempted to dive in straight into testing. They'll think we can test anything, let's do this, this, and this, without really understanding the foundations first. So let's take this first point in a little bit more detail. Let's look at goals. The reason why I say goals are important to look at in mobile conversion optimization 
is for that reason that we looked at earlier. Mobile can be different to desktop. People can have different goals. Let's take an example. Suppose we're working for a travel website, an OTA. We want people to come to our website to book a holiday. At this point, it sounds pretty, like, pretty much like a standard scenario. There's not, not necessarily any reason why we might want a different experience on mobile compared to desktop. But then when we look at it in more detail, in particular when we look at the journey that a customer is going to go on, we can see some of the complexities and also some of the opportunities. Because if you look at this customer flow, the research and planning and shopping phases can become quite complicated for something like a holiday. Very few people here, I imagine, would go to eBookers or Last Minute or whichever holiday website you use and will book a holiday in your very first session. Typically what people will do is that they will go through multiple sessions. They will speak with their partner, with their family or with their friends before they come to that final stage of booking the holiday. And that can span one week, often frequently more than that. If you combine that with the fact that mobile is increasingly used as a starting point for every online experience, it starts to show us that opportunity. And this data is a couple of years old. This was produced by Google back in 2012. Even then, four years ago, mobile was the main starting point for most online activities. In the time since then, that will inevitably have increased. So we can start to see how mobile can represent a different opportunity to desktop. So again, we ask ourselves that same question, do we still want the same experience? Let's take a look at an example for that. So on Kayak, obviously this is their desktop website. The primary call to action when you're looking at flights is select. If you click on that, it will take you direct to the site where you can book the flights. Compare that to mobile. This is the flight results screen. There are no calls to action here. But when you tap on a flight, it will take you to this screen. Again, you can see go, which is a primary call to action. It does the same thing as select on desktop. But as I've helpfully highlighted, we've got that secondary call to action as well to save. Kayak recognize that people are going to be frequently researching on mobile. They're not going to whip out their mobile and book a flight to Vegas straight away, unless you're Rob. Um, people are going to be looking to see how they can capture that research phase. And so they've introduced that secondary call to action. And as you can see from the third screen, they make it very easy for people to sign up to give Kayak their contact information. So that means that Kayak knows that when that person comes back to looking at their flight to Vegas, when they're going to actually whip out their credit card and pay for it, they're more likely to come back to Kayak. So that's why it's important to look at the goals when looking at mobile conversion optimization. We need to understand what are the primary and what are the secondary goals we should be considering. Let's then move on to looking at the second phase, data and insight. There's a huge amount that we can talk about in terms of data and insight. We're just going to pick up on a couple of key points here. The first is understanding how people behave online. There's a really effective behavioral model from a psychologist called BJ Fogg in the US. He says that there are essentially two factors you need to consider, motivation and an ability. Motivation is how motivated is the visitor to converting, and then ability, how easy is it for them to do something. Obviously, the further you are towards that top right corner, the more likely people are to convert. So these are the two axes that we can influence. If you are, say, top left, just where that top of the red line is there, that's when you are very motivated to convert, but it's really hard to do. It's quite a high friction activity. So an example of that might be the old Ryanair website. Looked like crap, very, very hard to use, very clunky, but the price has meant that people were very motivated to convert. On the flip side, if you're on bottom right, that's where something is very easy to do, but people aren't particularly motivated. And that might explain why people will frequently buy things from Amazon that they don't necessarily need just to give themselves something to do. Obviously, our goal is to be top right. So let's take a look at how some of this can apply to mobile. So if we're doing product analysis, product and choice analysis, if we look at what people buy on mobile compared to desktop, we'll often see that people behave in a very different way. I'll give you an example. FTD, they are part of Interflora in the US. You can kind of guess what they do from their desktop website. It looks terrible. It looks like crap. Um, but this is their experience for desktop users in the US. They know that desktop users will behave in a certain way. If you compare that to mobile, they know that mobile users are very much focused on same-day delivery. Compare that to here. Same-day delivery, 
is only mentioned down here. It's a kind of secondary call to action. Some people may not even see that, and they'd have to rely on other elements on the page. But on mobile, they know that most people who are coming to, the, to their website on mobile have probably forgotten someone's birthday. They've forgotten Mother's Day. They need to get flowers urgently. So the website still looks like crap. Um, it's not even clear that it's a flowers website but they're making it very easy to pe for people to convert. You've got the same day delivery panel here and the call to action there as well. So in doing that, they're making it very easy for people to find the product that they want. They are focusing very much on that, if I flick back, the ability access. Likewise, hotels.com here in the UK do something similar. Again, they're focused on making that ability um, as easy to use as possible, making the website as easy to use as possible. So here's a really quick example. This is very subtle. If you look at the search form on desktop, the default check-in and check-out dates will go to this coming weekend. So if you look on the Tuesday, it will show you for the Friday and the Saturday. If you compare that to mobile, however, it defaults to today. So this screenshot was taken yesterday. Uh, it shows you that night, checking out tomorrow. And also, again, they've got this secondary call to action, local deals for tonight. So re they recognize that users are focused on mobile, on booking hotels for that night compared to a stay that weekend. It's a very subtle difference, but again, it helps to nudge people along. It helps make the website slightly easier to use. Then on content prioritization, this is again a challenging subject on mobile conversion optimization. We know that there's a huge amount of content that we have on our desktop websites. So this is the homepage of amazon.co.uk. There's a lot of content here. If we were to print out all of this page, it would be around the same sort of height as Tyrion Lannister from Game, Game of Thrones. When we have to put all of that content into the screen around the same size as a mobile phone, it becomes a challenge. It's hard to know what to prioritize especially when we have competing parts of the business looking to emphasize their content. So there are two quick um, tricks or hacks that we can use to look to see what we should be prioritizing. The first is using heat mapping. So if we use a tool like Hotjar or Clicktail, we can see where on the desktop website people are clicking. If they're clicking on certain key areas, whether it's in the menu or on the main content of the page, we can appreciate that those are probably the areas that we'd also want to prioritize on mobile. When you then understand what those pieces of content are, we can then come to wireframing. With wireframing, it's very easy to start loading up Photoshop or Axio or whatever wireframing tool you've got and start to make something quite complicated. One way that we like to start wireframing is, as you can see from this horribly pixelated image, with a business card. So business cards are quite handily the same sort of size as a mobile phone screen. They're about four inches corner to corner. That means if you take a blank business card, or if it's blank on one side, you can use that and a Sharpie pen to start wireframing out your content. It will force you to think in a mobile mindset as opposed to wireframing on a desktop computer. <clears throat> and then finally, there we go, form optimization. This is a very quick and also very dull point that I wanted to make. It's very important though, so I wanted to include it. The majority of websites on mobile have some sort of problem with their forms. Around 85% of them, excuse me, will have an error in their forms or something that is suboptimal. Again, this is focused on that ability access. In particular, we're talking about the default keyboard. So Granger.com in the US, when you go to enter your credit card number, it will prompt you to type in letters and you have to click manually to change that as opposed to giving you the keyboard screen, which is A, much easier, and B, the keys are that much larger as well. Even subtle points like Newegg, who are a well-established brand and should know better, on their email address field, they haven't turned off auto-capitalization. So it means that when you start to type in your email address, it will auto-capitalize the first letter. And while that shouldn't be a problem, for some people it will cause concern, it will add a little bit of friction into the flow, and it's a very easy thing to fix. Again, this is a super dull point. I don't want to dwell on it anymore. Uh, if you want a cheat sheet, go to baymard.com. They will tell you exactly what to do for every single field on your form. And it might make it only 3, 4, 5% easier, but that will obviously add up very, very quickly. So we've spoken about data and insight, and now for the final two sections, 
strategy and testing. This is when we can start to apply what we've learned so far about our visitors, what will make them more likely to convert. And this is where we can start to reap the rewards. First off, the prioritization of your tests is one of the most important things that you can do. When we look at a testing roadmap, there are two things that will indicate our success. One is the volume of tests that we're running on the website, and the second is the average impact that each of those tests has. So there are really only two things that we can affect. We can do more tests, or we can make them more impactful. And ideally, we'd do both. So when we're looking at prioritization, we need to make sure that we're doing the right kind of tests at the right time. And there's a very simple way to prioritize your tests. <clears throat> so if we are British Airways, and this is our mobile homepage, suppose one of the tests that we want to run is to change the call to action at the top from book a flight to being a red button. It's a pretty simple test. It's probably not the right kind of test to do. I imagine the reason why people aren't booking a flight on BA is probably because it's probably not because the button is the wrong color. It's likely to be some other factor. But this is a very simple example of a test that you can run. So if we're going to prioritize this, we just plot it on a very simple graph, impact against ease. Impact is how impactful do we think this change is going to be? And ease, how easy is it for us to make that change? Is it going to be quick to roll out? Or is it going to require a lot of stakeholder sign-off, a lot of development work? Is it going to be that much harder? So, if we're looking at that test, we're going to say it's going to be super quick to build a test. We could probably do it in 10, 15 minutes. But the likelihood of it having an impact is pretty minimal. So let's plot it somewhere down here, bottom right. But let's compare that to another test. So if we look at the search form for a flight, this is kind of complex. It's, it's quite long as well. It's around two and a half screens in total. It's a little bit overwhelming. If we're BA, we might say, we think we can come up with a better version of this that can fit just on one screen so it doesn't look quite as imposing. And we'll do a quick wireframe and it will look something like that. This time around, we can say, OK, we think in terms of impact, it's going to be a fair bit more impactful than just changing the color of the button. It's going to be a bit more work, but maybe 10, 15 hours of development work, nothing huge. Might require some development sign off. It might be a little bit political, but we think we can get it done. So again. If we're plotting that on the graph, we might say it's somewhere in the middle, slightly top right. When we plot out all of the tests, we will see that they're kind of going to be pretty much scattered all around. Then we can apply some very quick prioritization to it. The place that we should start, obviously, is top right. These are the tests that are going to be high impact and easy to do. That's where we need to start our optimization and testing. There is also this quadrant here, which is high impact but low ease. And for these kind of tests, we need to prove the concept first. They probably shouldn't be the first tests that we run because they'll require a lot of work to do. So we might want to see, is there a way that we can nudge them top right? Can we take that test and make it into a simpler concept? And then in the bottom row, if we have time, we can do those tests, bottom right, and obviously bottom left, hard to do and low impact. Shouldn't really focus on those at all. So that's how we can start to prioritize the tests. When we've got that, then, and this is the final part of the deck, we need to look at how we can make a scalable testing workflow. What I mean by a scalable testing workflow is kind of a pretentious way of answering the next question. What do we do when a test finishes? This will determine a lot of how successful your conversion optimization campaign is. Most people will think in a very scattered way. They'll have a very tactical approach to conversion optimization and testing. And this is what a tactical approach to testing looks like. You'll have tests that don't work and tests that do, and sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll have a good result. But you might also find that some of the tests overlap. You'll test the same thing a few times over because you have different people. You have churn in your staff. They'll recommend testing the same thing, and no one knows that you've done it before, and it's a little bit scattered. This is a very tactical approach to testing. It's pretty disorganized. To apply a strategic approach, to testing, we need to answer that question, what do we do when a test finishes? Typically, there'll be two results. A test will lose or a test will win. If a test loses, there are three possible reasons for that. The first is that the concept was at fault. It was just a bad idea in the first place, and we should never have done it. The second is, actually, the, con the concept might have been OK, 
but we just did a bad execution. The design or the copy or something about how we tested it just wasn't quite right and we need to do it better. Or there could be an external factor. It could be an issue of seasonality, product availability, something happening in the market that just affected how the test ran. Obviously, for each of these, there's a different outcome. If the concept was at fault, we can just abandon it and move on. We don't need to test the idea again. If it was the execution, we'll probably want to retest it. We'll think, OK, let's do the design better. Let's write the copy better. And let's come up with that again. But we might want to reprioritize that. We might want to say, we have already tested this once, so we think we can do better, but let's deprioritize that according to something that we've never tested at all in the past. And the same goes for an external factor as well. We might want to reprioritize it. We might want to retest it, but it shouldn't be as important as something that's completely new to us. So this is what we do if a test loses. The flip side, obviously, is that the test wins. That's obviously a great result, but there's a lot more that we can do to push that. Again, there are three outcomes. The first is that we amplify it. This is where we take that same concept and we dial it up. So can we apply that same principle to the same page, but just be much more aggressive about how we've done it? So if, for example, we offer a, if adding a six to day returns policy to our fashion website increases the conversion rate, what would happen if we added a 90 day returns policy or a 365 day returns policy? Would that increase the conversion rate even further? The second level is scaling it to apply that same principle to other parts of the website as well. So if adding, again, that 60 day returns policy to the product page increase the conversion rate? Should we do that on the shopping basket as well and throughout the entire checkout flow? Would that, again, push the conversion rate higher? And the one that people always miss is this third one, sharing that result. It's obviously important if we're focused on conversion optimization to share the data that we have, both with people focused on acquisition, people focused on PPC and SEO, so they know these are the kind of principles that will make someone more likely to convert. This will motivate someone, so it might also work in PPC ads, for example. But also, it can influence product as well. And at conversion.com, a lot of the tests that we're doing now are focused much more on product level changes rather than just headlines and relatively simple things like that. So we're testing out entirely new pieces of functionality. Putting this all together gives us a very strategic approach to conversion optimization. So rather than having that very scattered testing approach, what we find is that if we have a test and it loses and the concept was at fault, that's as far as it goes. But if we have a test that wins, then we will scale it. We'll try a few different variations of that on the same page, and we might come up with a better result, and that will keep on going until eventually we can't squeeze any more out of it. But then also we can apply that same concept to other parts of the website as well, and obviously that can lead on and on. So what that means is we're magnifying the impact of every single successful test that we have. And the reason that's important is the more mature your conversion optimization program gets, the harder it is to get those successful increases in the conversion rate. So when you're first starting out, you might get a 40, 50% hit rate. In other words, one in two tests that you run will be successful, will have a positive increase on the conversion rate. But when you get more sophisticated, so for Google, for example, only one in 10 of their tests is successful, leads to a business change. And the reason that's important is that we then need to be much more strategic about how we think about testing. We can't just test anything that comes to mind and hope it will work. We need to make sure we're testing the right kind of stuff. And so that's the approach that we take. It's very, very quick for half an hour, so do please grab me afterwards or in the break with any questions. Thank you.